All right. So let's move forward a little bit with infectious diseases here. This will be chapter 10 in your book here. Now the, the information here is like in other lectures where it's not, um, may not go exactly in the same order as your book here, but this is um, stuff that I've put together um, using a couple of different things and uh, it's information that I feel like we should hit on. So um, just remember that, that when it comes to infectious diseases, we're not talking about just, um, just things that affect an individual. What I mean by that is that an infectious disease outbreak could infect communities as a whole, states as a whole, countries as a whole. Um, and so with that, there's certain aspects of our job, especially in health sciences um, and the healthcare profession, that, that are actually regulated by either governmental or other agencies that helps to decrease the spread of these infectious diseases things that you've heard of before, OSHA, CDC, um, CDC, probably one of the top names in infectious diseases, you know, the CDC gets involved um, worldwide, um, it's usually a pretty big deal, right? Um, the CDC is two hours away from here, and within their facility, they've probably got just about every nasty disease known to mankind, stored somewhere in that place. The Ryan White CARE Act requires medical facilities to notify emergency personnel of transmitted diseases involving patients they transported. And so this is an act that is here to, to protect you. There's certain information that we know that we just can't give out because of HIPAA, right? And because of privacy protection law. This is information here that should only be given out to pertinent folks. But the way, the way that it is kind of interpreted and the way that I interpret it is the fact that if, if Lisa transferred somebody who had a communicable disease and she possibly got stuck she has the right to know that, hey, you need to do some follow-up and maybe even some prophylactic treatment to make sure that, that you, um, this exposure doesn't turn into something else. So um, <clears throat> we've got a degree of reporting that we have to do. Um, and most of the time, we're not really involved in the agency reporting. Um, the hospitals are involved in the agency reporting. We're just involved in getting good information and reporting it to the receiving facility. Um, you've got endemics, epidemics, and pandemics. What was the fear last fall of an epidemic turning into a pandemic? Ebola. Ebola. And then them bringing them doctors that got contacted or that got infected with Ebola over here to America and them going out and spreading it everywhere, and it hasn't been an issue, right? But there was a lot, a lot of concern that, hey, you're bringing this, this nasty disease overseas into America, and we may be faced with a pandemic. So pandemic meaning something that's affecting more than one nation or more than one country. So even now, Ebola is an, an ongoing epidemic in the sub-Saharan countries of uh, Africa, and then endemic is going to be more of a localized issue. You know, um, not too long ago, back when the Opelika Sportsplex first opened up um, in their little splash park, several kids uh, got infected with E. coli because it was in the water and all that. One of the nasty little, little diaper wearers pooped in the water, I guess, and, and another kid got it on their face or drank it or something. And, and so anyways, um, that, that turned into an endemic. Um, <clears throat> our role in this is number one is, is to protect ourselves and 
to try to prevent infectious disease from being spread. And so that's not always just dealing directly with a patient, but it may be dealing indirectly with a patient, meaning a patient that was infected has been inside of our ambulance, and we've got our responsibility to the next patient that we pick up to do what? Disinfect and clean up your ambulance. Um, communicable diseases, and you should know this by now, are diseases that can, that can be transmitted from one person to another. Um, <coughs> and it depends on certain things. The dose of the, the, the disease, how much of the disease that carrier has got, the virulence, or, or how, how, um, how strong that, that disease is. The mode of entry and the health status of the host, which the health status of the host is probably going to be one of the more important factors as to whether a person uh, receives a communicable disease or not. So you've got direct transmission and indirect transmission, and that's through contact transmission. What's an example of direct transmission? All right, injection or you know, a sexually transmitted disease, um, indirect transmission, <coughs> you didn't wash your nasty hands, and then you went and uh, you touched on another patient, and you transferred the germs from this patient to the other patient. You've also got droplet transmissions, which is what we talked about in the case study, um, airborne transmission. So what's the difference in droplet and airborne? Right, so, so droplets going to be like some mucus or something kind of suspended in the air and then, you know, I chew, you just sneezed on me and it got all over me, whereas an airborne transmission is that, that, that pathogen itself is actually able to be transmitted through the air. And then a vector, what is a vector? Yeah, something that's carrying that disease, such as a mosquito with a West Nile virus or a tick with Lyme disease. So it's something that actually is a carrier and it transmits that disease from one person to another. Um, it's a very good idea to know what to wear as far as PPE goes. I'm not going to go over this whole chart here, but the things that, that, that's very important is understanding what should I wear a mask with? What should I wear gloves with? And at the end of the day, the bottom line for PPE is, is we do this so that we can protect ourselves, but if I'm protected, then that means that I can treat this patient just like I would any other patient if I've got the right PPE on, right? You know, even something like AIDS. As long as that patient is not just squirting blood to where I'm going to be covered in their blood or whatever, I can wear gloves and treat that patient just like I would a patient that's not infected with HIV or AIDS, right? Your most important rule, though, as far as disease transmission and all that is what? Washing your dirty, nasty, stinking hands, fool. So, should we go over each and every one of the PPE and the equipment? No, we shouldn't. All right? What are some of the uh, safety aspects as far as <coughs> needle sticks and preventing needle sticks? Sharks container immediately, no matter what we're doing, never ever ever lay that nasty needle down on the bench, which is a habit that we're all in. Also, never ever ever recap a dirty needle, dirty needle, right? So if I've given Peter a shot of epinephrine, I don't want to take the cap and put it back on it. I just want to get rid of that, that um, needle. Now, if I've drawn up that epinephrine, but I'm not ready to give it, then I can try to slide that top back on, right? But you run the risk of infecting yourself because it's very easy to, um, to get a needle stick. Um, just want to talk about this really quickly. If you are exposed to anything, even the, the chance of you being exposed, you've got, to you've got to think about your future, 
your career, your family, and everybody else. And you've got to report that exposure. You've got to get in touch with your infection control officer to find out what are the steps I need to take because there's prophylaxis for different diseases. Does everybody know what prophylaxis is? So it's, it's heading it off at a path. I'm, I'm getting treatment to, to prevent this from happening. Um, and so it's very important that, that you get in touch with your infectious control officer. So there's several different um, steps that they'll follow. I'm not going to go through all that. Um, if you are exposed to a needle stick, no matter what, you don't know if your patient is giving you all of the information. Right? You don't know if they're telling you a complete history. So if I stick a patient and then I get stuck by that dirty needle, even if it looks like, you know, the, the cleanest, nicest person in the world who would never do anything that gets the, the, the sexually transmitted diseases and all that stuff, we still need to report it and we still need to have blood drawn. And they'll be looking for things like HIV, HBC, HCV, syphilis. Um, now, also, they will need to draw the patient's blood as well. <laughs> Because if I'm exposed to <coughs> HIV, there is a there's something that's got to happen inside of my body <coughs> for lab work to even show that that I've been exposed and I've got this disease. Y'all know what that's called? Huh? Window phase. Window phase. <coughs> Window phase, but there's actually something that happens in the blood itself. Seroconversion. Seroconversion. And so essentially what seroconversion is, is that my blood is going to show that it has the antibodies or that it has the, the, the things to try to fight this disease. My body has started the inflammatory process or the immune process to show that these diseases are in there. Um, you know, something like HIV. <coughs> HIV is a virus. A virus, do y'all know how little a virus is? It's so little that it's, you can't even, you have to use an electron mi uh, microscope to even see a virus. So it's not going to show up in the blood as far as, oh, well, I see that HIV virus sitting there floating around, right? There's certain aspects that happens in the blood, certain things that happen with your T cells and your leukocytes and stuff like that, that, um, that, uh, that have to happen for us to tell. So nonetheless, that patient needs to be tested, all right? So we keep seeing this DICO, it's just a designated infectious control officer. They're the ones that monitor um, uh, compliance and make sure that we get what we need if we are exposed, all right? So obviously a lot of this infection control or this infectious disease lecture is aimed towards us preventing transmission of it or us acquiring these diseases because they're dirty nasty diseases um, at the end of the day though no matter what we're always going to use PPE we're always going to use our gloves we're always going to use our correct hand washing on all patients and that's called what standard precautions and then we've got to further decide what we're going to use all right so um, <coughs> Vaccines. I think that you're signing a death wish or, or doing something that's extremely reckless if you get into the health field and you do not get vaccinated. That is very, very reckless. For, for you, for your family, and for those of you that are around you. Why do we get certain um, vaccines? As healthcare providers, well, the CDC tells us to, but they've identified these as high risk, um, high risk um, diseases for us that are in the field. That's why we get TB testing every every year. That's why we get the MMR, and then we get the titers for it, the varicella, everything that 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 you had to have proof of are high risk diseases. 
departments that you work for should have a um, exposure control plan and we've even got that in the school here. We've got exposure control plans that are, that are written or approved by, by Dr. Shiver and then approved by <coughs> whoever else is in that process. That way you are covered if you are exposed and we know what to do. Um, different terms here. Um, we've got to identify if something was contaminated, infected, and who's the carrier of the disease. That should go without saying. It's pretty easy to, um, to understand there. Communicable diseases and infection, it just doesn't start one day and end one day. Highly communicable diseases, they've got a chain of infection that the next thing you know, you're sick, the next thing you know, your whole house is sick, the next thing you know, the daycare will look where little Susie goes to school, all those kids are sick, the next thing you know, those families are sick that have the kids in the daycare, the next thing you know, all of y'all are sick because little Susie brought the disease home to me and I came to work the next day, so obviously communicable diseases are a big deal. Um, different um, things that, that infect, y'all should know this right, bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, fungal infections. Why are viruses sometimes hard to control? Yeah, there's, there's, there's nothing necessarily that's just going to go in and fight off that infection like it can with bacteria. There are certain medications, antiretrovirals, um, things like that, but they don't necessarily kill that virus. What they do is they, they affect the replication and the synthesis of, of, of it converting RNA to DNA and all this kind of stuff. What's one of the problems with treating bacterial infections though, especially nowadays? Well, yes, resistance, immunity to antibiotics, because bacteria are smart little things, and they figure out ways to adapt, and so if we're, if we're giving antibiotics out that don't need antibiotics, then those bacteria are getting a little taste of this and they're like, oh crap, we need to stay away from this so let's replicate or let's change our form so that we can become resistant to that. This is rampant. You got MRSA, VRE, all those kind of things. All right? So when we get into management um, of these types of patients, of infectious disease patients, number one is always going to be what? Huh? BSI, PPE, what do we need to recognize that we need to wear to protect ourselves and protect the patient, to protect the community from us transmitting this disease? Other things that we need to consider is focus on life-threatening issues because there's not a lot that we're going to be able to do for this pneumonia, but there is a lot that we can do for this pneumonia where the patient's full of rails and they're having trouble breathing, right? So we may not hang um, a dose of, of vancomycin or amoxicillin or something up in the ambulance, but we can control their airway. We can help them in that aspect. Also remember that these patients oftentimes will have associated fevers, so we need to try to help cool them off. We need to consider dehydration. Even if they haven't reported vomiting and, and diarrhea, a lot of situations they still may be dehydrated because of, of sepsis, because they're going to those next steps. And while I'm on that, sepsis is very, very vital that we understand what to look for in, in that. An infection is one thing, but if a patient is, has become so infected that they've become septic, that's a whole different ball game, and that is critical and life-threatening, all right? Y'all need a break, or can we keep going? All right, I'll go about 10 more minutes, we'll take a break. So meningitis, where are your meninges at? Around your nervous tissue, right? <coughs> so, if the doctor said, hey, at the end of the day today, 
You're going to have meningitis, but you can choose whether you have viral or bacterial meningitis. Which one would you choose? Viral, because it's a lot easier treated than bacterial. So, meningitis has a couple of um, textbook or hallmark signs and symptoms. What are they? Photophobia, stiff neck, stiff neck headache, high fever. high fever. So when somebody is infected with meningitis, they are not always communicable. So they may not always be able to transmit the disease, but we pretend like they are because Meningitis is a pretty bad deal. We had a lady come into the unit um, three or four years ago that um, she was showing a lot of signs and symptoms of meningitis. She, she was actually unresponsive, um, showing a lot of signs and symptoms. We got Dr. Maldonado in there, um, who is the infectious control doctor at East Alabama, and he just, he just made mention of small, small chance that this might be meningitis, and next thing you know, the whole hospital had been um, had been given a dose of Cipro. If you if you even looked at the patient, you went to the uh, the, the pharmacy and got you a, a Cipro pill, which is an antibiotic that uh, that's pretty big. So um, we talked about the the typical um, signs and symptoms with the management of a patient with meningitis. Obviously, we're going to need to get um, our standard precautions. Um, place a mask on the patient, and I would probably wear a mask too, just to keep myself safe. Um, and then symptomatic management, and that's what we're going to see with all these. Um, again, just like a lot of the disease processes that we've talked about over the past few weeks in this class, you're not going to see meningitis every single day. But it's one of those things where you need to have that information in the back of your mind so that if you do see that patient with meningitis, you're going to say, hey, stiff neck, photophobia. I don't know for sure, I ain't no doctor, but I'm gonna say you've got meningitis at least for the next 15 minutes, so here's a mask that's going over your face so you don't infect me, right? <laughs> um, Ciprofloxacin, <coughs> that's what I was talking about just a minute ago that, that uh, we all had to take a dose of. So, menin, what? Mm-mm. She did not. Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a uncommon communicable disease, but it is a pretty big deal if somebody gets it because of this right here, multi multi-drug resistant TB. You can't just give a dose of an antibiotic in a lot of cases and this tuberculosis goes away. What are some of the telltale signs of tuberculosis? Productive cough. Alright, productive cough, often with what? Night sweats. Night sweats, hemoptysis, what was hemoptysis? Blood. Yeah, blood in the cough, bloody sputum. Also, we don't just look at the signs and symptoms of that patient, but what are other things that we look at that can help us determine? Living conditions. Living conditions. Um, where are we going to often see tuberculosis if we see an outbreak of this? Alright, so prison. You've mentioned group homes. So essentially where you've got people living in very, very close and oftentimes unsanitary conditions. We have a lady that lives in Opelika that um, she's flagged for having tuberculosis. She lives in a single wide trailer with like eight or nine other family members. So they've got first line um, drugs that they give for tuberculosis and then as they get on down they have to give um, even more potent antibiotics. And now one thing that you should understand about antibiotic medications is that um, Yes, they do fight that particular um, infection, 
if, if it's the right kind of antibody for that. But they also will kill off the normal flora in the body. Right? And so if we kill off the good bacteria as well, what's going to happen? You're still going to get sick, right? Um, so TB is an uh, airborne particle droplets incubation is 4 to 12 weeks. So you may come in contact with this patient and it may be two months before you even know if you got it or not. Night sweats, fatigue, hemoptysis, hoarseness. Pneumonia. Here's the deal with pneumonia though. Pneumonia is simply inflammation of the lungs. Which oftentimes turns into infection. There's more than 50 types of pneumonia identified. So Regardless, if we have one type of pneumonia or another type of pneumonia, essentially, we're still going to have the same signs and symptoms, right? It's not necessarily our job in the field to determine is this a gram-positive um, infection or a gram-negative cocci um, infection. That's for the doctor at the hospital to decide. So we're still going to treat them symptomatically. RSV. What is RSV? Respiratory syncytial virus. Who do we see RSV in? Babies. Young, young, young kids, babies. When do we see RSV? Oh yeah. So what time of year? Late fall and winter. Same time that you see the flu. Highly communicable between little kids. Parents have to be extra careful sending their kids, their babies to daycares and Sunday school nursery and things like that because all it's all it takes is just one little kid to get their whole class sick. Alright? So here's the thing about it though. Initially, sneezing, runny nose, and cough, which is another sign of what? What? Teething. Teething, <laughs> yes. A common cold. So you have to be very careful because if you have this, then it could lead to this. Tracheobronchitis especially, laryngotracheobronchitis, um, croup. Bronchitis. Does anybody have time for that? Nobody. Ain't nobody got time for it. So remember that we talked about COPD where we have chronic bronchitis and emphysema. And then this is just going to be acute bronchitis. So inflammation of the bronchioles. Caused by several different things. Um, and essentially they're just going to have to get on the dose of antibiotics. Lar laryngitis, most often caused by overuse of the uh, vocal cords. Usually a viral issue. Epiglottitis, seen in, in especially younger children. And then the common cold. Mono. E mono. So mononucleosis is caused by a virus called the Epstein-Barr virus. The Epstein-Barr virus is what causes mononucleosis. What is a street term for mononucleosis? Kissing the kissing disease. disease. However, you don't have to kiss somebody to contact mono. E mono. One of the issues with any of these infectious diseases is, is that most of them have the same signs and symptoms. And even something like swollen lymph nodes. You may also see swollen lymph nodes in the flu. 
Anybody ever got sick with the flu or with a cold and your neck swelled up just a little bit? So in a lot of situations, for you to get kind of more of a accurate determination of what's going on with them, you need to get a good detailed history. The flu. The flu. So if you haven't heard by now, there's more than one type of flu, right? Here's the thing about the flu. It's bad news. It is really not something that you want to get. Um, the outbreaks here recently with influenza have been especially bad, at least in my adult life that I remember outbreaks of the flu. And it might have been just because I was working in the unit then and, and, and out in healthcare. But I've seen young people, you know, my age, 30 years old, who had died from the flu because it got so severe in their body. So how do we help prevent that? Get a flu shot. Get a flu shot. Now, here's the problem with the flu shot. It doesn't work. Well, it does work, but it may not fight off this year's strain of the flu. Um, however, it does help. It does help. Now, this may be the year that I get the flu, but I've never had the flu. And I've worked in healthcare for the past 10 years, and I've been around some folks that have the flu, and I've never had it. So, yeah, knock on wood immediately. I know. Um, and I've gotten the flu shot every year. Maybe I'm just confident in the flu shot. I don't know. But anyways, as healthcare um, professionals, you need to be vaccinated. <laughs> well, gonorrhea. <laughs> so we're moving from one nasty thing to another really nasty thing. So gonorrhea. Most likely, if you contact gonorrhea from your patient, <laughs> it was probably. Some contact that even gloves and a mask wouldn't prevent. So, we're also going to talk very bad things about you as well. The male signs and symptoms and the female signs and symptoms are a little bit different in this. A male with gonorrhea is going to have a discharge from the urethra that's nasty. I don't really want to even describe it because it's just nasty. Whereas females, they may have some um, discharge, but they're mainly going to have severe pain. All right? And they're going to possibly have pelvic inflammatory disease. What is something, what is one way that you can identify that a woman has pelvic inflammatory disease? Yeah, the PID shuffle. We'll create a dance called the PID shuffle. Not really. That would be silly. Stupid. Syphilis. Syphilis is another bad disease. Yes. Those guys. What's it? Miss. Um, I can't remember what movie it is, but it's a very good movie. It's Miss Something Toys. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Miss. Anyways. Why do they still have the ramifications? It's, it's a movie that's based off the uh, Tuskegee Syphilis Project, um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a very good movie that, that really details, you know, the things that they did to these men, which was really, really um, unethical, and if that were to happen today, these doctors would end up in prison for the rest of their life because it was very, very unethical. Does everybody know what I'm talking about, the Tuskegee Syphilis Project? You don't? So, back in the 30s, yeah, I think it was 30s, 40s. Um, back at the turn of the century. Um, do what? Oh. <laughs> there was this big study because they wanted to test the effects of syphilis. 
And so what they did is they, they contacted all these men down in, in Tuskegee, and they promoted this as a project where it's going to help you out, it's going to help your family, free health care, and all this kind of stuff. But they essentially, paid, what? They paid them a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit um, to get them in. Um, but uh, essentially what they did is they infected all these men with syphilis, and most of them just got placebo treatment when they came back in because they were what they were wanting to do is really study the effects of syphilis on the human body and um, and not any drug or anything. They were wanting to see what happened to the body when you get syphilis. So all these men unknowingly got infected with syphilis through, by these doctors and then they did the study on it and all that. And um, um, like Will said, you know, there's still families that are affected by this and they're, they're still, um, I think there's still a few of those men that are still alive now. Um, so anyways, that, that's, whenever you talk about syphilis, especially in this area, you always think about the Tuskegee Syphilis Project. Um, and it's pretty interesting um, as far as what they did. Another thing really bad about it is a lot of them, once they figured out they were getting sick, tried to go get treatment, and they were going to the doctors, and they're like, oh yeah, we'll help you. Mm -hmm. And they were just giving them placebo, but they weren't helping them, because they knew they were sick, but they, were nothing, they didn't know what they had, so they couldn't cure it. Right. What was that? That was like in the 70s? No, it was in the 30s. Oh, it was, it was like five years ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, with syphilis, there's a couple of different stages of syphilis. You got the primary infection, um, where you get the canker sores, and then um, you get on into the secondary and uh, tertiary phase. Now, there's also the latent phase where you walk around um, with it, but not showing any signs and symptoms. Um, genital herpes, um, you know, again, another STD. Um, you get these nasty sores. <laughs> It started at 32, and they kept studying them until 72, and the U.S. government stepped in and made them give them treatments. So they, I guess they followed the, the same guys they infected in the 30s. They probably weren't infecting anybody yeah. you know, at that until point. The 70s, yeah. In the 70s, they made them cure them pretty much. All right. Um, let's see, chlamydia. Another one of those nasty diseases. The bad thing about these is that these things are prevalent. You know, you, you don't know who, you don't know what these, the person sitting next to you has, and, and hopefully you don't find out. But um, you got to think about, you got to think about the the promiscuity and and the lifestyle that that goes on. You know, even on a, a college campus where there's 20,000 plus students out there, um, this stuff is rampant. You know, it's just not something that somebody sits around and talks about, well, my committee is acting up today. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you, may not, you may not necessarily know it. <laughs> and in all honesty, pre hospital. There's not much that we're going to do for this, all right? Scabies! Scabies are gross little nasty things. All this stuff is nasty. So, scabies are actually um, a parasitic infection. Little animals, little mites, that cause these intent, intensely um, itchy rashes, and essentially what the scabies bug does is it burrows up under the skin and you see these little raised lesions and all that, and they end up looking like a meth head because they scratch themselves to the point where they're bleeding. What are we going to do? Try to get them out of our ambulance as quick as possible. Lice, the same thing, except they hang out in hair. Nasty. Now, why do we bring these up? Because have you ever been into some of these patients' homes before? I don't know. Yes, you have. <laughs> you have been in these patients' homes, and you're taking your stretcher in there that has a sheet on it and has things where these little bugs can hang out. Also, they can hang out in your hair and your, your, your clothes and stuff like that. Um, I worked yesterday. The last shift that I worked, I was at EPS. Uh, we had a crew coming in just 
freaking out because they had uh, they thought that their patient had bed bugs and all that. And oh, okay. Were you with them? Yeah. Was it Moses that's got scabies twice now? I don't know. <laughs> um, did they end up having bed bugs? No, I mean, the patient had them, but we kind of had her wrapped in her own blanket yeah. the whole time. <laughs> we couldn't find anything in there. We all, of course, just pulled it off. Yeah. Totally. And we all changed clothes and showered. All right. <laughs> All right. Break or keep going? Hepatitis. You got hepatitis A, B, C, D, and E. It's five distinct forms. It's five different hepatitis viruses, but they all affect what? The liver and the blood. Well, they don't all affect the blood, but they all affect the liver. Which one is the one that we're of potential concern about? B. B, hep B. Hepatitis B infection. So, we get a patient that we know has hepatitis B. What do we do? We treat them like any other patient. We just wear our gloves. We wear our PPE, right? Um, everybody in here at this point should have had your Hep B vaccination. Hep C, um, it can be uh, transmitted several different ways. The main way is blood to blood and sexual contact. Um, you know, uh, I don't know a whole lot here to tell you other than just knowing how it's, it's transferred and, and what we would do. Nothing really other than symptomatic treatment. You know, I mean... Hepatitis D, this is percutaneous exposure. Hepatitis A, I don't know why it wasn't in there, but hepatitis A, how is that transmitted? Oral fecal route, right? Somebody gets poop on their hands and that poop gets in their mouth and then they swallow it. <laughs> All right, HIV, HIV and AIDS. They, you all often hear them going together, but you've got to understand HIV and AIDS are two different diseases. Right? You all understand that? HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. AIDS. Acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, right? Is that right? Is that what it, no. You seen this, heard about this? Yeah. Now, HIV often leads to AIDS, right? But they are two different diseases. Um, what is what is the the main deal with HIV or AIDS? Either one of those. How does it affect the body? Shuts down your immune system. So it affects the immune system, right? So what kills you are these opportunistic infections, right? Opportunistic, what does that mean? It takes the opportunity to take advantage of the immune system. So it's an opportunistic infection. All right? Um, and so again, this is a virus that essentially goes in and changes the whole um, changes the whole genetic makeup of that particular cell how do we treat a patient with HIV any other patient with gloves and being careful because I don't care if you've got HIV or if you're you're don't have HIV I don't want to be stuck with a needle that's been stuck inside of you right period so I'm going to take the same precautions with you as I am with you as I am with anybody else and we do that so that we don't 
compromised patient care and we don't give the stigma, oh, well, this person's got AIDS, so I can't treat him the same way I treat somebody else. Because that was a stigma that was, that back in the 80s and 90s, um, that these patients didn't receive treatment the way that they should because of that. But as things have moved forward, we understand as long as we're using our proper PPE, then we're okay. All right? Compared to other things. It's a very small, very small chance. I mean, you've got a much higher chance of contacting the flu from your patient than you do getting AIDS from your patient, you know. Um, there's a couple of things with um, AIDS itself that, that um, you start seeing as one of the ways that, that doctors have determined or predicted what's going to happen next in the body is certain levels of the T-cells. When the T-cell counts gets below a certain level, and so what are the T-cells? The T-cells are what? They're, they're part of the, the, the leukocytes, so they're part of the inflammatory response that you've got killer T-cells, you've got helper T-cells, you've got all these different cells, and those are the cells that AIDS virus essentially affects and so as these t-cell counts and I can't tell you numbers exact I can't remember um, as they start to, to get lower and lower then they expect that this different thing is going to happen or this thing is going to happen where you get PCP uh, pneumocystic corona something pneumonia here or um, then they get cytomegalovirus k sarcoma these are things that you need to look up in your book because all these different things here um, are very, very um, telltale in the AIDS disease. k sarcoma is a disease that you're not going to typically see in any other patient other than a patient with AIDS. Did they say that as like a history of that? It's the same with history of AIDS? What? I've got a history of Kaposi sarcoma. <laughs> I mean, I guess so. They. I'm gonna be honest with you. I've. N I don't want to say I've never had a patient, but I've not had too many patients that had AIDS or HIV or anything like that that wouldn't tell me that they had it. I mean, because they understand the severity of the disease, and they. I mean. They understand that, hey, the reason why I had to call 911 today is probably because of something to do with this disease that I've got. So I very rarely have ever had anybody just not tell me that they've had that disease. So, but to answer your question, I very highly doubt that they're going to say, hey, I got Kaposi sarcoma or, you know, something like that. And even if they do, some of your older medics out in the field are going to be like, what the crap is that? <laughs> for AIDS. All right? Norovirus. So norovirus is one of those that comes out of the front and out of the back end. So what will we be dealing with these folks? Probably dehydration. I don't know why. I guess hepatitis A made it over here because of the, um, the tummy trouble. But it is a fecal oral route. I mean, I guess hepatitis A is not all bad because smokers lose interest in smoking as one of the symptoms. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Monty Python says. You always got to look on the bright side of life. I got hepatitis A, but I quit smoking. <laughs> Let's see. Hepatitis A is not very much seen around our parts, but there is. Um, I've never been outside of the country other than to like the U.S. Mexico border. But for those of you that have, you especially certain areas of the world. Has anybody been to like a, a third world country where you had to get a ton of vaccines and stuff like that? Yeah. What all did you have to get? I don't remember. 
It was like seven shots. Yeah. Really? You have to go and they just. It kind of goes by the region that you're going to, and they just start sticking. Really? Yeah. 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 All right. Have that is V D. You can see that. All right, let's take about an hour. I've been going at it for an hour and a half now, so. All right, vector-borne and zoonotic diseases. What does that mean? Um, other animal was born carrying on something. I guess it would help to have this up on the screen, wouldn't it? Probably. All right, guys, we got to start it back. Yes, these are going to be transmitted through a vector. Um, so vector-borne and zoonotic are going to be kind of one and the same. Also, um, most most common ones we think about is ticks and mosquitoes, but there are other types of organisms. What? The plague. Yeah, the plague, transmitted by rats. Mm. Well, when it flees on the run. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you want to answer it? All right, um, U.S. Nile virus. Haven't heard as much about it in recent days, but it's still something that was affecting this area and, and, and south of us as well. Um, transmitted by mosquitoes. Now, the patient could have gotten um, gotten it from a mosquito, but you could get it from a needle stick. Lyme disease. It is pretty common around here. The big thing with that is a rash around the area that what bit them? A tick. From what I understand about Lyme disease, it's usually on the white-tailed deer around here that, that transmits it. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, also another disease that is from the bite of a tick. You don't just see this in Colorado, where the Rocky Mountains are. Hantavirus. Hantavirus is um, transmitted by rodent poop. So, you know, you think, oh, well, that's, that's nasty. Uh, I would never eat the poop of a rat. But have you ever cleaned out a cabinet and whether you realize it or not, you saw the little rat pellets? Mm -hmm. I mean, I haven't done it in my house, but I'm just saying, maybe some of y'all have. Isn't that why you're supposed to wash your vegetables too? I would think so, yeah. That and um, the other oral fecal, you know, because uh, um, a couple years ago, there was a big deal of um, E. coli, I think it was, E. coli or salmonella, on the one I'm thinking about was strawberries, and it was it was picked by workers out in the field, and they were taking dumps out in the field, and uh, I guess they're I guess they're under production, and they needed to get it done, you know. I mean, but nonetheless, I always wash my stuff. Um. Antivirus, it, it can be a pretty big deal, but bottom line is, no matter what they got, um, you got to get a history, but we're still going to treat them. You know, if you got a patient with pulmonary syndrome, even if they got an antivirus, yes, we're going to um, most likely have standard precautions. Well, we will have standard precautions on, but if they got fluid in their lungs, shortness of breath, low blood pressure, what are we going to do? We're going to put a CPAP on them, right? Supportive measures. Rabies. Anybody know who that is? <laughs> it's old Yeller. Old Yeller. 
I was going to put the picture of what was the boy's name in Old Yellow? Oh, John. Yeah, a picture of him, but it was just too gut wrenching. Um, <coughs> rabies is a pretty bad deal. Um, rabies has some pretty, um, pretty weird signs and symptoms, along with your normal signs and symptoms of infection. Hydrophobia. They, they don't like to get anywhere near water. And then just really bizarre behavior. And that's all because of the neuro um, effect. A patient that um, may need to get the rabies treatment for that, it's a bunch of um, a bunch of needles. They have to get lots and lots of shots. I had a friend that um, she thought that she uh, they heard they heard uh, bats up in their their attic. And for whatever reason, she had this little lesion show up on her arm one day, and she thought that she got bit by a bat in her sleep. Well, she went to the ER about it, and they're like, "Oh, you probably got rabies." And she had to go back for the next three weeks, I think it was, and she had to get like five or six shots in her stomach. Yeah. Wasn't there some time passing around Huh? <laughs> 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 tetanus! How is tetanus? How do you contract tetanus? Rusty stuff. Yes, yes. Rusty nail getting cut with rusty metal. <laughs> tetanus is pretty bad too we don't see it as much now because you have your tetanus vaccine but what is one of the common things you would read about or hear about with tetanus lockjaw lock jaw. Lock jaw. Lock jaw. <laughs> infection with antibiotic resistant organisms what do we mean by that? Well, it's these um, bacteria that, that are resistant to normal, conventional um, antibiotics. And they're even getting resistant to the ones that we used to use to fight them. What's the river that flows through Montgomery? There was like 20 cases of it because the sewage treatment plant dumped rock sewage in the river. I've never heard that. I don't know what river that is. Is it the Little Alabama or whatever? Alabama. Yeah, Alabama River. I was reading about it in the paper. MRSA is one that we hear about a lot, and it, it's um, it's one that we see on the uh, we we see lesions on the skin. Um, oftentimes, this will just be shortened and called a staph infection. Staph infection. Um. <coughs> Oftentimes, these patients will need to undergo an incision, an IND, um, incision and drainage from the soft tissue infections. Um, you know, um, I know, I know somebody that actually had a staph infection just in her finger, and they had to go in and kind of drain that pus out and all. Um, if we got, what we got concerned about in the uh, ICU, and what would really get people sick with MRSA is when they became septicemic or this MRSA was not just on the outside of their skin, but it actually went into their blood. VRE, or this is VRSA, vancomycin resistant. So these are bacteria that used to be killed by vancomycin, which is a type of antibiotic, and now they don't. This was what I was talking about, VRE. Um, often seen with UTIs. Now, a lot of these are um, considered nosocomial infections. Nosocomial is actually an outdated term. Um, we now call them what? Hospital acquired infections. Here's the bad deal about those is just the fact that this patient went into the hospital with one issue and because of whatever reason, now they have contracted these other issues. 
And why would it make sense that these kind of things run rampant in the hospital, these, these antibiotic resistant? Because where is one of the places that you get lots of antibiotics? In the hospital, right? This is one of the reasons why they're so, so particular about urinary catheters, indwelling catheters in the hospital, VRE. Because one of the big causes of the UTIs. If a patient gets a hospital-acquired infection, the hospital has to eat the cost of that treatment, and sometimes it can be very, very pricey. Because insurance is not going to pay for something that the hospital gave them. And as a matter of fact, I could be wrong on this, but I think that a patient that doesn't have insurance, they still will not be responsible for the cost of, of the treatment for something that they acquired in the hospital. C. diff. Anybody ever heard of C. diff? Anybody ever smelt C. diff? Because once you smell it, you will never, ever, ever forget it. So C. diff, it is a pretty bad deal and what happens in C. diff where we saw it a lot at the hospital was patients that were on continuous antibiotics and what happened is, is that those continuous antibiotics killed the normal flora in the guts and so the C. diff started to run rampant and it produced and produced and what it does is it causes lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of watery nasty diarrhea to the point where we actually had to put the, um, the, the fecal tube in there behind to where it was like a catheter that was stuck in their butt and it filled up and we would have to change that bag two or three times a day because they pooped so much, so much. So, we get a patient like this, what are we going to be expecting? Dehydration. Common communicable diseases of childhood, these should be covered a little bit more in um, special pops, but things that we've talked about before, bronchiolitis. What is one of the things that, that children with upper respiratory infections, what's one of the main treatments that we want to give them? Very simple. Humidified oxygen. Humidified oxygen. <coughs> you got croup, laryngotracheal bronch, or Laryngotracheal, yeah. What is one of the telltale signs of croup? Still bark type call. Measles. This is something that's come up in the news recently. Why? Because of people not getting their children vaccinated and putting the rest of the population at risk. I'm sorry, but that's just selfish. And that is, if, if you're going to go against the past however many hundred years of research on vaccination for a for an article on Wikipedia that says your kid may get autism if you get a uh, if you get a vaccine, you're dumb. You're just dumb. <laughs> I'm sorry. If anybody in here is an anti-vaxxer, you're going to end up sick. Promise. So measles, this is a pretty bad disease. Only certain protection is immunity, which is the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. Rubella. A lot of these are affecting the um, the upper airways as well. Mumps. Don't see these as often either. Males, if you give the mumps, you're in bad you got bad bad deal because your junk's gonna get swollen too. Is that a good medical term, your junk? <laughs> Chicken pops! Did anybody's parents in here actually like make you go play with that kid that had chicken pox so that you would get chicken pox so it would run its course and you'd be done with it and you didn't have to deal with it? Yeah. 
I didn't have to do that, but my little sister got chicken pox, so my mom just kept me home with her. <laughs> and we both got chicken pox at the same time. My mom had to deal with two whiny kids for about a week, and then, you know. Now, if you've had chicken pox, though, you stand a higher risk to get what? Shingles. Shingles. Shingles, the herpes zoster virus. Herpes zoster. So, you know what chicken pox is. Itchy, itchy, itchy. And it could have some bad, bad deals here, but um, usually it's just a really bad rash and it goes away after a few days. Pertussis, not seen as much now. Pertussis, also known as a whooping cough. Now, I've not really dealt with any children that's had pertussis, but my wife worked in peds and she, she's told me that those kids are sick, sick, sick that get pertussis. And in some situations, they actually got it from their parents. It was transmitted from the adult to the child because it's got a much more profound effect on a child. SARS, the severe acute respiratory syndrome. SARS, that's what our old lady had. Fever, headache, overall feeling discomfort, body aches, dry cough. A lot of the uh, information that, that we gained from her led to the thinking that, hey, this might be pneumonia. So a lot of the same stuff's going to happen with SARS. Avian flu, um, something that was not really seen around here a whole lot. And we're done. Um,